Uh, he is actually the co-founder and CEO of a company called Need8, which is located here in Japan. And it's a kind of sponsor of our apparel, which is going to be uh, to come after uh, this meetup. So if anyone would like to have, um, would have more questions for any of our speakers, I would invite you to take some time to stay with us after the meetup in Paris with a view of the lake and mountains. So a little bit to introduce a little bit uh, Martin, uh, he was educated, educated in Poland and uh, telecommunication at the uh, University of Science and uh, Technology in Paris, and this is uh, our equivalent of uh, one of the best universities in Poland. And after this, he moved to France and also working in telecommunication. But what is really interesting, and uh, we can find it also in his LinkedIn, he started doing his PhD uh, startup in Poland. And uh, this startup becomes so successful that in just 18 months he got offices in five cities and become a complete success, efficient, and profitable. And after the PhD, he actually went to Swisscom and uh, he worked at, it was, it was on, or Bern? Or it was Bern. In Bern, uh, where he was finding on another of, uh, of uh, career and becoming more and more uh, responsible. And at the end, he was a successful team of Ted. The head of data science division with over 80 people under, uh, in his group. And now he decided to start his own company again to beat his 18 months uh, record for his profitable. <laughs> and I really wish uh, it will happen. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for kind introduction. So uh, I was supposed to start with an introduction, but after this, you know, I, I don't need to introduce myself anymore. Uh, we're going to be talking to you together with uh, Mihao, our chief technology, who is sitting right there. And he's going to be uh, presenting the really interesting part of the speech. So uh, stay tuned. This is our agenda. So first, I would like to tell you a few words about Unitate. So where we come from, uh, what we are doing, who we are. Then second part will be uh, quite high level. So we're going to be flying on 10,000 feet. Um, and third idea is to share with you some of the experiences we are making while working for industry and trying to implement AI out there. And the last part will be a case study that Miha will present. And there we're going to uh, be showing you our engineering for good case. And we're going to show you how to use deep learning to uh, detect pneumonia in X-ray images. So first of all, uh, Unitate, you know, um, I'd like to explain you why we think that the world needs uh, one more AI and big data startup. And the reason is that we see this sort of digital monopoly forming. So there is a handful of companies out there that essentially attract most of the digital talent. And this leaves more traditional companies, especially in Europe, left behind in terms of adoption of technology and, and US trends. And this is exactly the mission we give ourselves uh, to basically um, help those more traditional non-digital native companies to jump on the digital train. And to do that, we assembled an experienced team of people who, as I like to say, have been there and done that. So they worked for large corporations, they worked for small startups in the AI space, for some unicorns from Silicon Valley, um, and they gathered broad experience that now we put to use to help our customers basically solve some of the biggest problems with a mixture of software, artificial intelligence, and data science. Uh, if you're a startup, culture is super important. So this is our culture. We have six pillars. And don't worry, I will not walk you through all of them. But I would like to draw your attention to this one, positive impact on the world. We really believe that there is not enough discussion in our industry about the real impact of our actions. So we are not uh, spending enough time thinking about the outcomes. And as a result of that, we have cases like Cambridge Analytica popping up. And this is exactly the reason why we decided in Unitate that this positive impact on the world will be essential element and a cornerstone of our culture from day one. And we leave it in two ways. So first way is by being selective. So we really 
we are really careful who we work with and what we work on. So we will walk away from certain deals if we don't have a good stomach feeling about the overall impact of what we are doing. And the second way we leave it is by contributing pro bono to social good cases. So we give our employees part of the time that they can spend on working for NGOs or they can contribute to cases like the one that you're gonna see presented by Michal. So that's it about Unidate, and let's now discuss our experience and, and this industrial perspective uh, for AI adoption. So we are in quite unique position because we happen to work for nine different industries. So we worked already for telecom, aviation, gas and oil, finance, fragrance and chemicals, just to name to you. And this gives us quite unique position because we really see patterns emerging throughout those industries and we can see what are the commonalities, what are the differences between those different uh, companies. So what we do see definitely is uh, indeed a revolution happening in a sense that in almost every industry that we see, uh, AI and big data and data science is a topic that is being discussed on the board level and we see really impactful cases being implemented. This means dramatically different things, of course, if you're in aviation, that you're in finance. So starting from predicting a failure of plane engine through uh, catching the bad guys <coughs> using financial records if you're in finance, through detecting fraud and clicks if you're in advertising industry, up to improving the manufacturing processes. But consistently, in those different industries, we see more and more impactful cases being implemented. Um, we also see very different maturity depending on the sector. So this is a figure that I borrowed from McKinsey report, which talks about digital mat maturity of different sectors. So you see, uh, for instance, retail and telecom quite high up, uh, and public sector, uh, infrastructure, private equity, on the lower end of, of the spectrum. This is generic digital uh, uh, index. But we do see a very similar curve being followed when it comes to artificial intelligence and data analytics as such. And this is of course no surprise because you cannot do analytics if you don't have good infrastructure, you don't collect your data systematically. So we see those companies, uh, these companies from those sectors struggling the most because they have the biggest homework uh, to uh, to do before they can jump uh, further. Also, I wanted to tell you how we see the techniques being used uh, in, in concrete cases. So quite often people think AI means deep learning. What we do see is actually a renaissance of the methods that are maybe not as fresh, but equally impactful. So we see uh, companies using NLP optimization techniques uh, basic statistics, machine learning, and from our perspective, being a vendor, it doesn't really matter if we are using the newest and greatest deep learning method or we are using optimization technique as long as we provide the value to the customer, right? And we do see that very often actually logistic regression does the job very well or the optimization techniques, uh, algorithms from the 70s are a perfect fit for certain problems. Um, I wanted also to tell you a few things about key challenges that those companies face. And uh, I would be curious um, to know if you have any idea what is, according to our perspective, the number one challenge that the companies face when it comes to adoption of AI, big data, data science. Well, what do you think? They don't know what to do, okay. Good, yes. Somebody else? Implementation. Implementation. So the number one challenge that, according to us, companies face is close to what you mentioned. So data uh, are basically residing in silos, right? So this means that even before you manage to start working on your case, you realize that the data you need are residing maybe in 15 or 20 different systems across the organization. Uh, underlying technologies are different and often they are 
also managed by different departments, which adds to this complexity. So this is a pure data integration challenge that you need to first do a first homework before you can think about uh, solving the, the real problem. The second big challenge we see is what I call misaligned expectations. And this is a really interesting one. So I was talking to an executive in a large multinational a few weeks ago, and he was telling me, look, Martin, every morning when I open a newspaper, I hear about AI taking over the jobs, uh, you know, uh, disrupting another industry, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a topic that we obviously discuss in the company. Then we usually turn to our traditional suppliers and on marketing slides, everything looks great. Then we engage in a pilot and very often we don't see any AI. We see a lot of manual work, a lot of manual labor and actually we are not achieving what we would like to achieve, right? What do we do wrong? And I think he was really touching on the, mm, on the point because there is so much noise out there currently uh, about AI, machine learning and data, data science that decision makers are getting confused about what is really possible and also about what it takes to actually implement those cases. So this is also a challenge for us because this means we need to do a lot of education to first explain the customer what is dreams and what is possible and also then what it takes to solve his problem. Another issue, this is all an obvious one, is a missing talent. So a lot of companies struggle with that one, uh, no surprise. Um, and here especially, I think it's difficult for the in incumbents, the traditional companies to attract uh, the required people. And the reason for that is also that sometimes, quite frankly, they do it wrong. So um, these people are used to certain standards of working, to certain setups, certain culture, and if you try to bring them in and fit them into, uh, well, yeah, not so modern way of working, uh, you don't get very far. And the last key challenge that we see is about infrastructure. So if you're doing analytics, you need two things, you need storage and you need compute. And you need those in a very various forms, right? So you might need GPUs, you might need hard drives, SSDs, and also uh, the demand varies quite a lot, right? Traditional IT departments are often not that great in delivering on that agility. And very often the companies have hard time using public cloud infrastructure because of the compliance reasons, security, and other aspects of that sort. Uh, so as a result, what you often see is that the team, instead of working on the problem, is trying to fix the infrastructure is issues, firewalls, et cetera, et cetera. So you might be surprised by that list, you know, because you don't see anything about uh, tweaking the parameters of uh, your neural network, but this is the list that actually we came up with when we thought about where companies really struggle along the way to apply AI. The good news is that uh, there are also good examples when companies succeed in the implementation of, um, of their cases and we see successful projects being run. So we thought also about what are these key ingredients that we typically see in those cases and here they are. So first of all, you have business and IT on board and this is essential because oftentimes what we are implementing is quite pioneering. So it's not the case that somebody or many people did maybe 10 or 20 times before. We are exploring a field in which things are unclear. So you need to have excellent collaboration between people who understand the domain, the IT and the data science team. Clear objectives and clear objective is not please optimize my company using AI. When we see successful projects being implemented, from day one, there is a clear vision and clear KPIs, clear objectives being set. And this allows the team to really focus the attention to solve the real problem. So this is our success factor number two. Third one is a bit related to silo um, from the previous slide, data availability. So if you want to solve a problem, you need to have the required data to do so. And again, this is not always the case because the companies sometimes struggle with the basics, with the collection. Agile and DevOps is definitely uh, the methodology to follow. 
costs. So again, because of the uncertainty, because of the uh, exploratory um, characteristics of the projects we run, you know, agility is, uh, is required. And finally, skilled engineering workforce. So these 10x engineers uh, are extremely important for your success. And here again, uh, I would like to stress the fact that we often implement cases which are uncertain and the cases where uh, we are really sort of pioneering, right? So you need to have this skilled workforce that will bang their head against the wall until they really come to the solution. So this, uh, this is it from my side. And as I said, the third part will be done by Michal, but I guess Pavel we would like to introduce him first. Perfect, thank you. So thank you very much, but uh, before we introduce another speaker, uh, so thank you, Michal, and um, uh, Martin, sorry. And uh, if you have any questions, please, this is a chance to, to ask them. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that clear targets are a success factor, but when you start with something, especially in a big company, how can you actually put a target when you don't really know what to expect? Mm -hmm. I believe data science should be a bit more like trying to explore have an exploratory part. So to what, how would you define yeah. clear target? Yeah. yeah, yeah, so you know, it's, it's of course a trade-off, but I think you need to have a clear intent, right? So when I talk about clear objective, it should be something like, uh, let's say we have a factory that is running sub-optimally. We want to analyze the data with the intent of improving those five KPIs, right? And then you of course let the team think how to do it, explore the possibilities, etc but it has to be sharp enough to focus and narrow your attention because otherwise the scope of the possibilities is, is just too huge. No. Yes, please. Um, I like very much what you said in the beginning that you're very selective in uh, the project you work on or to target. I was wondering how do you make these decisions? How do you practice? Sure, sure. Well, uh, you know, we are early stage company, right? So we, we're not, to be honest with you, faced yet with really tough uh, calls. Um, and there is no clear cut. It's more a gut feeling, right? So the team has to feel good about the industry, about the company, about the impact we have. There are some companies for sure we wouldn't like to work for. I will not name them, it's recorded, you know? <laughs> <laughs> But there are some industries we just want to stay away from, like surveillance, you know, these kind of things. We just don't want to do that. Uh, but for sure, there will be more gray zone cases where you're going to be thinking, okay, is this okay with us or not? And then we're going to discuss and decide. If the team doesn't decide, I will in the end. <laughs> that, that sounds like the... <laughs> Hard reset. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, any more questions? <coughs> so, we got a lot of those. So I'm not a speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you.